Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this multi-part video series, we will review the oral health topics you should be familiar with for the USMLE Step 1 exam. These videos will serve as a review of oral anatomy and the common oral lesions likely to be encountered on Step 1 and in your medical careers. As with all recordings, a PDF of each recording is available at the 12 Days website. Pictured on this slide is the overview of oral health topics we'll be covering, and in this video we'll present a concise review of oral anatomy and the high yield oral landmarks. In our anatomy overview, we will specifically discuss the anatomy of the mouth, salivary glands, and pharynx. We'll go through the anatomy of the mouth in the sequence that you encounter during an oral exam. Included within the mouth are their lips, teeth, tongue, gingiva or gums, and palate. The three salivary glands include the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. And lastly, the pharynx, which includes the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. But for purposes of this video series, we will stay focused on the oropharynx, mentioning the nasopharynx and laryngopharynx only for completeness. So here we go. As we look into the mouth with the tongue raised, we initially encounter the lips, gingiva, and alveolar mucosa. The gingiva proper covers the alveolar bone and meets the teeth. The alveolar mucosa is the unattached area of the gums that is shiny and red when healthy. The teeth are fixed in the alveolar bone located in the maxillar and mandibular bones of the jaw. They are covered on the outside by enamel, the hard protective layer that is strengthened by fluoride. Underneath the enamel is dentin, a soft area that is prone to decay. The most interior layer is the pulp, which contains the nerves and blood supply of the tooth. The tooth root is fixed to the surrounding bone via connective tissue called the periodontal ligament. Moving on, the lips are attached to the gums and the gingiva via the labial frenulum, and the tongue is attached to the floor of the mouth via the lingual frenulum. Running along the floor of the mouth, extending from the base of the lingual frenulum are the sublingual folds. Deep to these folds, and beginning our discussion of the salivary glands, are the sublingual salivary glands which release their contents along the floor of the oral cavity. The sublingual glands consist of predominantly mucus-secreting cells, staining paler than the serous cells. Given this composition, the secretions are viscous and have high mucus concentrations. The sublingual gland is innervated by the corda tympani, a branch of the seventh cranial nerve or facial nerve. Moving to the submandibular gland, you will note the openings on either side of the base of the lingual frenulum. These are the sublingual papilla, also referred to as Wharton's duct, found in the sublingual folds. The submandibular gland consists largely of serous cells but does contain some mucus secreting cells. Be aware, the parotid gland contains solely serous cells, so remembering the submandibular gland has both types of cells helps to distinguish the two. Like the sublingual gland, the submandibular gland is also innervated by the corda tympani branch of the facial nerve. And the last of the salivary glands is the parotid. The parotid gland is the largest salivary gland, and unlike the submandibular and sublingual, is innervated via the glossopharyngeal nerve, or cranial nerve 9. The nerve fibers run through the otic ganglion. This is an important distinction, as damage to this ganglion could affect function of the parotid gland. The opening of the parotid duct is located on the buccal mucosa at the level of the second molar. This landmark is clinically important as swelling of the duct surrounding area or purulent discharge from the duct can indicate infection or obstruction. The parotid duct, also called Stenson's duct, empties into the parotid papilla, an opening in the mucosal surface of the buccal mucosa, and as previously mentioned, is located opposite the second molar. The parotid gland contains solely serous cells and has distinctive accumulations of adipose tissue. Be careful not to confuse parotid gland and pancreas histology. They are readily distinguished by the fact that the parotid does not contain the islets of Langerhans. Let's move on to the tongue. The intrinsic muscles of the tongue are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve or cranial nerve 12. The tongue has an apex, body, and root and has skeletal muscle fibers running in three directions a distinguishing histological trait to remember. The tongue contains four types of taste buds, fungiform, filiform, valet, and foliate. The corda tympani, a branch of cranial nerve 7, supplies the taste innervation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve 9, supplies the taste innervation to the posterior one-third of the tongue. At the root of the tongue is the foramen cecum, a remnant of the thyroglossal duct, the embryological structure that forms the thyroid gland. Now let's look up to the roof of the mouth. The anterior palate is the hard palate. Beneath the mucosa, the hard palate is formed via the fusion of maxillary and palatine bones. 
the posterior aspect of the palate is the soft palate. The more anterior arch of the soft palate is the palatoglossal arch. The posterior arch is the palatopharyngeal arch. Sitting in between the two arches is the palatine tonsil, consisting of lymphoid tissue. The uvula in the midline is innervated by the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. Behind the palatopharyngeal arch and uvula is the opening to the oropharynx, a shared passageway for both food and air. And finally, remember the epithelium inside the oral cavity is stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium except for the hard palate and gingiva, which are keratinized. The transition zone from keratinized to non-keratinized epithelium on the lip is called the vermilion zone. And that will do it for the anatomy review. In this review, we covered the basic anatomy you will need to better understand the pathology and disease processes to follow. In the next presentation, we'll begin exploring the important disorders you are likely to encounter during your Step 1 studies. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.